Hi, and welcome to our midweek Bible study. It is uh, April 24th, 2024. We are going to be in Job 39. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn there, we'll get started with Job 39. If you're continuing to join us in prayer, just continue to pray for uh, Warren Brown. <clears throat> he did have one stent put in, but he, he's got an infection behind his eye and it's causing him a lot of pain. So we'll be praying for him there. And uh, for Marisha, uh, under hospice care continually. Um, Botkin also for Steve Mead, dealing with an infection, but he's doing much better. Uh, Pete Montoya has surgery this Friday, day after tomorrow, on his knee. So we'll be praying for that. Deanna surgery went well last week for those who prayed for her. Appreciate it. Continue to pray for Beth Klopak. Uh, Chad Hunter dealing with issues with kidneys and uh uh, just not doing very well physically. So be praying for him. Uh, Tim Hennessy, uh, local man dealing with cancer. And for David Lazarek, pray for him as he continues to deal with pain uh, from his surgery that he had a few weeks ago. And uh, just keep those in prayer. And uh, let's do that. Heavenly Father, we give these prayer requests to you. Ask your will to be done with each and every one of them. Uh, pray for Pete's surgery this coming Friday that you would bless him and let it go well. Thank you that Deanna is recovering well. We just pray, Father, for your blessings on our study today. I'll let it be a blessing as God intends it to be in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Job 39. Now, we started in Job 38 last week talking about God's creation. Uh, he is speaking now. So we have knowledge and insight that God is... Uh, uh, speaking right things. And, and when we're going through the back and forth between Job and his friends, uh, sometimes we, we, it's hard to tell whether they're right or wrong. or We got to compare it with other scriptures. But when God speaks, uh, it's, it's just as like, it's, we talked about this in our Jeremiah study, it's written in stone with the edge of a diamond, so to speak. Um, so last week we talked about the foundations of the earth in verse four of chapter uh, 38, the cornerstones and the morning stars. And we talked about how all of these reference Christ, but it was talking about uh, the great creation. And then towards the end of chapter 38, in verse 39, and 40 and 41, we talked about uh, animals, the lion and then the raven. And so... Um, let's, let's begin this study to, to, with a little introduction. We're going to be talking about uh, various animals today. And the animal kingdom is uh, precious to God. But it's also important to us because it really, these, these instincts and behaviors and knowledge of the animals, it, there's, there's lessons in there. Um, um, Liz and I have these big devotional books we got from uh, Gothard Ministries years ago on the characteristics of, of Christ and God in, in the animal kingdom. And they're very, it's very interesting. Uh, we're not going to get into a lot of the details about animal behavior today, because with each animal we're going to talk about, God is making the point. And the, the point right off the bat is very simple. He is speaking to Job still about his authority over Job and that Job comes into counsel without knowledge. And he begins with, were you there when I created the world? And the answer, of course, is that is no. And the creation doesn't have a right to question the creator. The creator knows what he's doing. The creator is, is uh, superior and sovereign and now God uses this animal kingdom. He says in verse, let's, let's look at the last three verses of chapter 38. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of young lions? And so this is the idea of God taking care of the animal kingdom, feeding them, caring for them. You know, God has such power over the king of the beasts, so to speak, that when Daniel's thrown in the lions, then he shuts their mouths and they, they, they don't eat without God's permission, and yet God provides. When they crouch in their dens or lurk in their lairs and lie in wait, who provides food for the raven? 
when the young ones cry to God and wander about or for lack of food and uh, God takes care of the ravens. Well, th this is the idea of God caring for the lilies of the field, the ravens in the trees. In fact, it says about worry in Luke 12, 22, it says, I said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor the body or what you'll put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn and God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? So uh, again, we, we take this idea of God's care for the animal kingdom, and then we apply it to God's care for us. He is taking care of the lions. He's taking care of the ravens. And he says, so they don't have storehouses, and yet I keep them alive, the birds of the field. And, uh, you know, his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. It's that kind of thing of, of um, how God, excuse me, how God, I just thought about the eye and the sparrow verse. I have to make a note for that. Um, so when we see the animal kingdom, we understand that God has much more care for us. In fact, look at verses one through four of chapter 39. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear their young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fill or you know the time when they bear their young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. So God says there's, there's a cycle with animals. And, and one of the things that we've been able to do is through science and through observation, um, we've been able to have some pretty interesting animal documentaries that document, you know, and, and times of the season when the butterflies are going to be here or times of the season, Liz and I like to go down near Cambria and uh, go to north of San Simeon to, to see the, the, the seals on the beach. And, and they know exactly what time of year they're going to be giving birth, the time of year they're going to be molting, the time of year. And so these animals, you know, and you've probably seen the, the penguin um, documentary, like with the Morgan Freeman, and they sit on the egg, and the male does this, and the female does this, and we can learn so much. Um, but what's interesting when you're going to the zoos or you're watching these nature documentaries, um, that just like creation in chapter 38, in which we see the hand of God in the constellations and man steals the constellations and and instead of honoring god with orion we create this false religion of horoscopes and astrology um or we take god's the divine hand of creation and we say oh no 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 that didn't that wasn't god that just exploded some big bang and everything fell into place and so man has kind of hijacked God's creation and turn it into their own. Well, he's done the same thing with, with animals. You know, here's what God says in Genesis 1 26. God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that word dominion is watch care over them but it's also the idea of, of superiority we are created in our image he said let us make man in our image talking to the trinity there i believe god the father god the son and god the holy ghost only man is in the image of god and in this world today you know that most of the college professors are human most of the uh leaders in our businesses are human there's not a lot of Horses leading a company. Why? We're just different. We are created in, in we worship God and we praise his name and we um, preach his word. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but man has again turned this around. Instead, you know, we are just the evolution of animals and we're, you know, one with them and we're no different. And, 
And in, in many cases, people have much more respect for the animal kingdom than they even do human beings. They even turns into uh, sexual obsessions and things called furries and other little things that, that come on in the world today in which we have, again, perverted creation. And now we've perverted the great animal uh, creation of God. Instead of seeing Christ and seeing God in the creation of, of these animals, the Bible says in Romans 1.24, that God gave them up to uncleanness. This is those who suppress the truth to, in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchange the truth of God for the lie. The truth is God created heavens and the earth. The truth is that we are created in God's image. The lie is that this is all a big accident. And then the, the, the next step is the second part of verse 25. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. And we go to extremes. There's a, there's a difference between having dominion over animals, will care over animals, and superiority over animals, and then the worship of animals, the worship of, of environmental things. Um, instead of worshiping the one who created everything, we love creation. We love to talk about the trees and the stars and the animals and the kingdom and and we don't want to deal with human beings. Um, well, they are God's creation. You still have to deal with, with God. And so this chapter is dedicated to God's superiority over the animal kingdom. And he uses this to, to tell Job that, that he has no equal footing with God. Did you create the universe? Did you, were you there when I laid the foundations? Can you stop the lion's mouth? Can you feed the ravens? Can you make sure the wild goats uh, or, or the, the wild mountain goats are taken care of, uh, that they have seed to eat and they grow strong and then leave their parents and they have this secular uh, thing that, that animals have? Verse five, he says, who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the Oneg? And the Oneg is just a, another name for a donkey. Whose home I have made in the wilderness and the barren land his dwelling. He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The reins of the mountain in his pasture. And he searches after every green thing. So now he talks about the, the, his watch care over the, the wild donkeys who appear to be free and, and untamable. Their uh, donkeys are often a symbol of of uh, stubbornness. Um, and yet he says, who sets the donkeys free? I do. And I take care of them. There's an interesting place Liz and I have visited. Um, it is called uh, Oatman, Arizona. And it's just a little outside the city of Lake Havasu. If you've ever gone to see London Bridge, I want to encourage you to take a little, about a 20 minute drive uh, into the, uh, uh, kind of wilderness of a little ghost town called Oatman. Now, Oatman at one time was a pretty uh, bustling little town because there was gold there, uh, but the gold mines dried up and everybody left and it became kind of a ghost town. However, they brought in donkeys from, I believe it was Spain, uh, because it was tough to get to some of the gold and they would use the donkey obviously to uh, carry their supplies and, and get through some of the rockiness. Well, when the gold dried up, everybody left town, but they left the donkeys there. And if you go to Oldman today, it's still, there's donkeys everywhere. Liz and I went and visited and you're, you've got to be very careful when you're driving because they'll just stand, they're stubborn. They'll stand in the middle of the road and then you get to town and they walk into the stores and they just basically run the city. But God is taking care of them. Even when man left in that barren land, uh, these donkeys were, uh, they're stubborn. They just go where they want to go, do what they want to do. Um, but God, um, he caused the donkey to talk in Balaam's case. So what control does God have over the donkeys that, that he can take this stubborn animal and use it to, to preach? Um, Jeremiah 2.23, when talking about Judah's stubbornness against God, he says, how can you say I'm not polluted? 
you know, Jeremiah is preaching to them and they're stubbornly saying, we haven't done anything wrong. And he says, how can you say I've not gone after the Baals? See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You're a swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways, a wild donkey used to the wilderness. So the, the donkeys are a picture of, you know, he called the Pharisees stiff-necked. And this is the idea of, of their stubbornness, not turning to God. Well, what a great God we have in that he not only takes care of these donkeys in the wilderness, but he uh, controls their stubbornness, even using the donkey of Balaam to talk to them. What a God we have. Uh, then he says, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Now, in Old King James, um, it's the word unicorn. And there is a uh, animal called an auroch, A-U-R-O-C-H-S. Uh, and it says about the aurochs, um, the beast in question here, this is uh, written in a commentary I read, uh, it's not the fabled unicorn, uh, it, but it is a, uh, a wild beast that has been extinct since the 1620s. It was an enormous animal with the most powerful of all hoofed beasts, exceeded in size only by the hippopotamus and the elephant. It is the standard symbol of strength in the Old Testament, where it is mentioned nine times. So nine different times, this wild ox, this auroch, A-U-R-O-C-H-S, you can look it up. And it's thought to be the first actual um, identified animal that uh, became extinct. Um, but it, 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 it's extinction and whether it's an auroch or not an auroch or just a wild ox or some would say maybe a rhino. But it's, it's the idea of a, a big, giant beast of an animal that God tames. And, and it says about this, Numbers 23, 22, says God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn and the strength of a wild Ox. This is a fun game you can play with kids. It only works in the old King James. But you, are there unicorns in the Bible? Well, there, there's the word unicorn. But the animal is actually a giant ox with two big, long horns. In fact, Numbers 24, 8 says, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations of his enemies break their bones and pierce them through with arrows. So again, this animal, the same Hebrew word for this animal, a translated unicorn in the Old Testament, uh, is a symbol of strength. Deuteronomy 33, 17 says, His glory is like the firstling of the bullock. His horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, they are ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are thousands of Manasseh. Uh, Psalm ninety-two ten: uh, By my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall anoint thee with the fresh oil. So the, this idea of this giant of an animal, with known for the horns and the horn and the strength of an animal, uh, the point is not what the animal is or who the animal. Is the point that the strongest of these oxes that Job would have known about uh, that God controls. He says, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed in your, by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes? Or will he plow the valleys behind you? Uh, Job uh, 39, 11. Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain or gather it to your threshing floor? So there's the idea that, that for man to, to tame this wild beast is so difficult. Um, but to God, um, this animal obeys. And again, I'm stronger than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm holier than you. Um, but what's great about that is, is these wild oxes, you know, the Bible says not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. They tend to drag you around like this ox does. Uh, but God says, come to me, all you who 
labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So, so in the Old Testament, God talks about having the strength of this wild ox in which he can destroy the enemies of, of his people. Uh, and yet in the New Testament, it's, it's a picture of Christ, the strong, amazing ox that is so gentle that, that his burden is easy. And instead of the world being yoked to the ox of the world that drags you around and, and, and destroys your life, God gives you life more abundantly. So be yoked to him. Um, verse 13 through 18 is really interesting. I think it's my favorite part of this chapter. Um, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like kindly storks? Well, so uh, you can compare the, the wings of a, of a, Ostrich. We always think of pride wings as being that of a peacock, and, and that's true. Um, what was interesting about an ostrich is that it it doesn't have what are th these little pinions are the are the the feathers that allow a stork to fly or, or birds to fly. Uh, you don't see ostriches flying. Uh, so what are they, even the purpose of their of their grand wings they, they can't fly they don't really do them any good uh then it says she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust she forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them she treats her young harshly as though they were not hers her labor is in vain without concern because god deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding when she lifts herself on high she scorns the horse and its rider. And so this idea of an ostrich, it, it's funny because God is, is I, I, if we can get this, it would really help us with our, our faith. But th this book, considered one of the, the oldest chronological books in the Bible in Job, and it describes, you know, stars and, and constellations and just incredible. And now it gives characteristics of animals that as science has grown to study these animals and follow ostriches and follow um, donkeys and follow goats, um, we learn that they have the exact characteristics that the Bible says they have. But at the time of Job, he probably didn't go to school and have a National Geographic magazine handed to him. He wasn't watching documentaries on the animal planet. Everything you knew about these animals, God had taught them. So it's pretty incredible how knowledgeable God is. And in this idea, he has this thing called an ostrich, this big giant bird with uh, amazing feathers, but no wisdom. Uh, just lays his eggs everywhere and leaves them there and man or an ox can step on them but god somehow you know this is thousands of years later and there's still ostriches around god has protected them provided for them um in god's sovereignty uh and yet to me an ostrich is a real picture of us without god uh we just certainly with the abortion issue, we are certainly treating our children the same way the ostriches do, just leave them to the wolves, so to speak. Um, why, verse 17, because God deprived her of wisdom. And we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So without God, we're just uh, like these donkeys that wander in the wilderness, stubborn as can be. And we're just like this ostriches that have no wisdom. And because of that, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how many human beings today walk their life without any acknowledgement of God. If we acknowledge God in all our ways, he'll direct our paths. And yet it rains on the just and the unjust and God protects them. So the ostrich is a really good example of God's sovereignty. 
why even make the ostrich this way? Um, but he does. And, and he's telling Job again, look at, I'm, I'm the same creator of the, of the goat. I'm the same creator of this, this ox. I'm the same creator of this donkey. And I created the ostrich to do whatever I want. And, and I didn't give him wisdom. That's why he doesn't know what to do. And without God, we'd have no wisdom. Do you see the point? Uh, without him, uh, we are blind, leading the blind. Thank God for Jesus and his word. Um, this next one is, is really good, too. It says, have you given the horse strength? Now, in our culture, we certainly have high regard for the horse. Um, and this goes all the way back to the days of the old West before the cars came about. And um, reminds me of uh, Karen Heinrich and dealing how her love for horses, but there is a, a, a little bit of a passionate relationship that man has with this, this aura of, of a horse um, and uh, a man and his horse and those old Westerns that we watch. And, uh, you can look at the old cowboys and you know the names of their horse, whether it's trigger or champion or whatever they might be. Well, he says, have you given the horse its strength? Have you closed its neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. Uh, just uh, you can do a lot. There's a lot of really dramatic films and movies about horses. One is called war horse and there's some dramatic scenes of this horse in in the bad weather snorting and there is something majestic about that that horse he paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength he gallops into the clash of arms he mocks at fear and it is not frightened nor does he turn back from the sword the quiver rattles against him the glittering spear and javelin he devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of a trumpet, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shouting. This, this war horse movie is a true depiction of a, of a horse that fought in battles. And there were times when, again, before tanks and guns and bombs, and things that, that these chariots and, and things were fought on horseback. And a uh, man with a good horse, that was something. And here, way back before the Western days, before we made heroes of horses, God already told us that horses were heroes. And this mighty horse, this beast, this majestic animal that that is wild in the wilderness, like a wild Mustang that, that a good man can somehow have a horse whisper and tame this horse. And uh, what a God. There was a God that created that horse. I mean, now the, the, this, you know, and if you look at what is supposed to be evolution, we can go all the way back to Job, again, the oldest chronological book in mankind shortly after the flood, and these animals haven't changed. The ostriches are still ostriches. Uh, horses are still horses. Um, donkeys are still donkeys. Um, and so apparently evolution has just stopped. But Or we can just read the scriptures and look at these animals and say, man, God, how mighty and majestic are you? Because you created such majestic beasts as these. Um, a lot about horses in the Bible. Psalm 147.10 says, He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. So again, we make heroes of Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, and, and, but the real hero is always God. It's not the horses. And Psalm 37.17, A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength you know trust in horses draw psalm 27 20 verse 7 uh some trust in chariots some in horses but we will remember the name of the lord our god 
as majestic and great and mighty and powerful as the horse. Um, God is who we need to trust in. God is who is our Lord and our Savior. Um, verse 26, does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings towards the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? Still today, we see the majestic flight of an eagle. It's our, it's our national bird, the bald eagle. And uh, we went, I think it was at the Grand Canyon we were at. And uh, we had one of those binocular things you could look through. And, and we were pointing to this little crevice in a rock where this tree branch was sticking out. And there was an eagle's nest in there. And uh, the, the person that was there, the ranger, pointed out to everybody who was watching. And, and again, it reminds me of this verse. They make their nest on high. And the rocks it dwells and resides in the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out its prey. Its eyes observe from afar. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Sometimes you'll see the... Uh, uh, birds flying over an area and you say well something died over there and uh, the bible talks about end times where the ravens and the eagles come and feed on the flesh of the enemies of god um so this this i all of these different animals that i mean what is more um we can look now at the science of an eagle flying and, and developed airplanes from god's design of flight but did you invent that, Job? It's amazing. Uh, uh, Gur says in Proverbs 30, verse 18, I like these verses a lot. It says, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four, which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a virgin. He says, boy, there's four things I don't get. Uh, the, the birth of a child or a man with a woman uh, a snake, how it, how it moves on a rock with no feet, no legs. I don't get that. Uh, how a, a large giant ship turns by the rudder, <laughs> and how an eagle flies. And he's thinking of the majesty of God in, in these things. Um, Isaiah 40 verse 30 says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God will give you strength like eagles. Um, Psalm 91, 4, talking about God, he'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you shall take refuge. So this eagle, boy, what a majestic animal that is when you're talking about even making it our national bird. So what is the point of all of this? Again, it's a very simple point. The lesson today is very simple. When you look at creation, last week it was the stars and the water cycle, the rocks and the trees. And this week it is, the, and we've, we've talked about what, four or five different animals here. There's so many others. Every time you look at things like the bombardier beetle, go look him up. He's incredible. And, and some of these creations of God, when you go into a, an aquarium and see the, the um, numerable, um, innumerable amount of fish in design that are in those aquariums, from small to great, from seahorses to sharks, it's just what a God we have to design each and every one of these things. And yet we have put man in it, into it and, and, that survival of the fittest and, and uh, evolutionary book. And, uh, and once Charles Darwin put down this little theory, man, man could not wait to scoop it up, plant it into our culture and society you know, through the 1800s and, and get God out of everything. Well, Job puts God back into everything. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, there's a writer named George Bradley. Here's what he says about this chapter. He says, there's one thought and one only. It is brought into the, is brought into the foreground. The world is full of mysteries, strange, unapproachable, overpowering mysteries that you cannot read. 
trust, trust in the power, in the wisdom, in the goodness of him, the almighty one who rules it. Trust the God who rules the universe, both in the animal kingdom, under the sea, in the air, in space, in universe, in your body. This is what God is saying to Job. Job, do you want to come into my chambers and, and have a word with me? Well, let me explain who you're dealing with. I am the one who made every animal in the universe, placed every star in its place, put every planet in the spot, put the sun where it belongs, the, the, the moon and the stars. So you're unqualified. Romans 9. Can he who has been created say to the creator, why have you made me like this? Not God forbid. Trust in God. He is the one who made it all. You trying to explain creation in the animal kingdom without a God is foolishness. It doesn't come out right. And it always leaves you with more... Uh, questions than answers but if you surrender to the one who created them all jesus christ as your lord and savior then you get to look at all those creation and go wow what heavenly father thank you for all you've done for us for your mighty creation lord let us worship the god who created it and not the creation itself in jesus name amen god bless you we'll get into some of the nitty-gritty next week as god is established his his place of authority and his overpowering majesty and so now it's time to talk to job which we'll get to next week have a great day